Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. Today, I want to look at what many consider to be a difficult passage in the book of Hebrews, and one that is often mistaught and is taught in such a way that people believe they can lose their salvation and come to a point where they're beyond redemption. But what is this section of Scripture teaching us? Well, first off, we understand that the book of Hebrews was written to the Jews, but in application, it has much to do with us. You're dealing with the priesthood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the book of Hebrews is known as a book of better than. I mean, there's Jesus is better than any angel. Jesus is better than any sacrifice. And we're looking in the book of Hebrews about the blood of Christ. When you get to Hebrews chapters 8, 9, and 10, it focuses on the blood atonement. So today, what I want to do is, is focus on what is this willful sin that ends up being, if you commit this willful sin, you have nothing to look forward to but judgment and fiery indignation that will devour you. So it's, it's a fearful thing, the Bible says, to fall into the hands of the living God. And it, is, it would be a fearful thing if we could commit this sin. But the good news for born-again believers is we cannot commit this sin. But this sin can be committed by anyone living now or anyone in the future dispensations to come with the tribulation period, Daniel's 70th week, and the millennial reign of the Lord Jesus Christ. So again, in Hebrews 10, 26 and 27, for if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin, for sins, now, back in verse 25, the Bible says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully. Now, I heard a man say one time that if you do not assemble with other believers, you are committing willful sin. And because of that, now you have a nothing to look forward to, but the, a judgment and fiery indignation that is going to devour you. Now that to me is utter nonsense. Not going to church, especially right now, because there's many churches where you can't find you know, the truth in. There's many areas in this country where there is no good, solid, Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church. In my area, there are, I think, two churches that, and I'm talking an area of about a 20-mile radius from my home, two churches that actually use the King James Bible, and the one church where I attended for five years, a, a Baptist church, so-called independent, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church, for five years I was in attendance there, there was no message ever preached on hell. None. Zero. Zip. Nada. The man that stood in that pulpit said that when Cain had sinned, it was when he didn't bring the blood sacrifice, it wasn't so much that he didn't bring blood, but it was his attitude. So I wonder if the man that preached in that pulpit was even truly born again. But what I want to focus on today is what is this willful sin? It's obviously not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. And any sin is willful. There's not a sin you commit that you don't do willfully. You may lie, you may steal, you may do anything, but whatever you do, you make a choice to do it. So it's not the fact that it is a willful sin, but it has to be a specific sin that God is talking about here that he says there's no more sacrifice for sin if you do this willful sin. 
I want you to notice too in this willful sin, it can only be committed after that you've received the knowledge of the truth. So you have to hear and understand the truth before you can commit this willful sin that would cause then to be no more sacrifice for sins. Now, Jesus Christ one time made a sacrifice forever. The book says in Hebrews chapter 10, verse number 12, but this man, talking about Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So Jesus one time offered himself for sin, and that's it. That's forever. That's the eternal atonement. There will never come any more sacrifice for sin. So we understand that it's Christ's atonement that ends all sacrifice for sin. But this willful sin here, after they receive the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin. There's not a sacrifice that can take away their sin if they reject the one sacrifice that was given for them. So let's just read this section of Scripture. I'll start again at verse 26, and we'll read down through verse number 31. For if we sin woefully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking of, for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden under foot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace? For we know him that has said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So we're going to look at what is the willful sin talked about in verse number 26. The Bible says in Hebrews 9.29, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God. Number one, the willful sin is the absolute rejection and disdain of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now, for Gentiles, we were never promised a Messiah. There are those I post things online about the rapture and make comments and, and videos. And the one comment that comes back so many times is, what, is there a third coming of Jesus? Well, Listen, for the Gentiles, there was never a promise of the first coming for the Messiah to come. The Messiah did not come for us. Jesus was a minister to the circumcision. He was not sent here for Gentiles. But because the Jews rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, now we have access and we can be grafted in. Now, I'm trying to find quickly here. Yes, it's in Romans chapter 15, verse 8, because that verse just popped into my head. Paul writes, Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers, and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. As it is written, For this cause I will confess thee among the Gentiles and sing, Unto thy name. And again he saith, Rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. So Jesus was a minister of the circumcision. He didn't come for the Gentiles. He's not the Messiah for the Gentiles. He is our Savior. He's the Son of God. He's the one that died for our sins. He's all that, but no Gentile was ever promised a Messiah. So this right here, the treading underfoot of the Son of God, it doesn't say the treading underfoot of the Messiah. So this is for both Jew and Gentile that would dare to reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, I realize the book of Hebrews is written to the Jews, but it is for Gentiles as well. 
In John chapter 7, verse 12, we see some of the disdain that men had for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, he, these are all Jews. Jesus came to the Jews. John 7, 12, And there was much murmuring among the people concerning him, concerning Jesus. For some said, He's a good man. Others said, Nay, but he deceiveth the people. Now, they were calling him a liar. They were calling the Lord Jesus Christ a deceiver. Now, C.S. Lewis, I believe it was years ago, said that either Jesus Christ is Lord or he's a liar and a lunatic. So these people, they said he's a liar. He's a deceiver. Others said he's a good man. Looking on in Matthew 9, verses 2 through 7, the Bible says, And behold, they brought to him a sick a man sick of a palsy, lying on a bed, and Jesus seeing their faith. Now, isn't that interesting? Faith is in the heart of man, but Jesus sees the heart. He saw their faith. Here he is, the Son of God, the, the Son of Man, robed in flesh, God incarnate, and he can see their faith. And he saw the faith, their faith, and said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. And behold, certain of the scribes said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. So Jesus not only saw the faith of the men that brought this man that had the palsy, he saw the faith of the man that was sick of the palsy, but he also saw the thoughts of the scribes that said within themselves, This man blasphemeth. So they were calling Jesus a blasphemer. And Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said, Wherefore think ye evil in your hearts? For whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Arise and walk. And again, how easy it just is it to say, like a Catholic priest, Oh, thy sins are forgiven. You can say anything. You could have uh, any man, I don't care if it's a, a, a man they call father, that you're not supposed to call any man father in this world. God is our father. But if you dare call a man with a collar on backwards father, you're making a huge mistake. And that guy has no authority for, to forgive sins in this world. Only God himself can forgive sins. No pastor can declare to you that your sins are forgiven. Only God can do that. And God does that in the heart of each individual. You know if your sins are forgiven or if they're not. You know if you're under the condemnation of God or not. You know if you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ or not. So here Jesus says to them, so which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to say arise and walk? But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Then saith he to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up thy bed and go unto, unto thine house. And he arose and departed to his house. But when the multitude saw it, they marveled and glorified God who had given such power unto men. So Jesus demonstrated these men, these scribes knew at that moment that Jesus had power to forgive sins because he had power to say, get up and walk. Some man that's paralyzed, get up and walk. But what did they do? They accused him of blasphemy. Another thing they did in John 8, 41, when Jesus said, ye do the deeds of your father, then say that, said they to him, we be born, or we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So here's these men. They heard the story, like everyone has heard, that there was a virgin named Mary that miraculously became pregnant, and not by a man, but by the Holy Ghost, as the Holy Ghost overshadowed Mary, and she was with child, and that child was the Son of God. So these men, they heard that story, but they rejected the truth of the virgin birth. And if you, friend, if you reject the virgin birth, if you don't believe in the virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, then you have no more sacrifice for sin, because you've rejected the one, the Son of God, and Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And if you reject that, 
In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him. Jesus Christ was God come in the flesh. And if you reject that, and you want to say that the virgin birth is a joke, and you ridicule and you mock that like these men did, you will find yourself someday falling into the hands of the living God. And it is a fearful thing. So number one here, the willful sin was the absolute rejection and disdain of the Messiah, the Son of God. Hebrews 9.29 goes on and says, Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing. The second thing, this willful sin, is rejecting the blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ. And notice that word, counted, hath counted the blood. That means you esteem it or consider it or account it as an unholy thing. What a thought. The precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the very blood of God, according to the book of Acts, the blood of the Savior that was shed to pay for sin and these men here, they count it as an unholy thing, as an unclean thing. You think of something unholy, you think of something wicked and vile. And these men, that's what they count, that blood. They esteem it as being unholy. In Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 15, the Bible says, But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. That sacrifice for sin that he gave, there, there remains no more sacrifice for sin. That was the final one. And he entered one time into the holy place in heaven, and he obtained eternal redemption for us. Notice, for if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, and just think, everything Jesus Christ did, he did by the power of the Holy Ghost. He did no miracle. He preached no sermon. He did nothing he, in the power that he demonstrated as, as the God-man, but through the power of the Holy Spirit. He was resurrected by the Holy Ghost. He preached by the Holy Ghost. He was filled, and the blood of Christ, through the eternal Spirit, that's how he offered himself without spot to God. And notice, how much more shall that blood purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Dead works is simply something that you're trusting in to get you in a right standing with God. And friend, there's nothing you can do to get in a right standing with God but believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that he died for your sin and that in that death, in that blood that was shed, there's an atonement given where he's purchased eternal redemption for us. Notice, having obtained eternal redemption for us. When you ob obtain it, he's, he bought it. He bought it with his own blood. And that should purge our conscience from dead works. You know, in the heart of man that's religious, he thinks he's got to do works. He's got to go to church. He's got to give to the poor. He's got to do this and do that and do the other. And all these religious things. And they are good things to do. But they are dead works because there's nothing that is going to earn you salvation in any dispensation. It's always been by the blood, always. You know, go back to the Old Testament. From the very beginning, God killed animals and made Adam and Eve coats of skins. And that blood pointed to the one that would come, that promise that God made when he said there would be one that would come that would crush the serpent's head but he would bruise his heel and the one that would come of the seed of the woman. So the virgin birth and the blood atonement, 
And notice how much more, if, if you're born again, you should have a complete assurance of your salvation. And that blood atonement should, should pride you to go ahead and live for God and serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice, and for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, that they, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. We have an inheritance in heaven which fadeth not away, eternal, reserved for us in heaven, God has purchased our eternal redemption. We have bodies that are going to be changed and be like the bodies of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all bought in the atonement of the Lord Jesus. So if you reject the blood atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ and you say it's an unholy thing, you have nothing to look forward to but a judgment and fiery indignation that will devour you. That goes for Jew and Gentile. The last part of that verse, the Bible says, and hath done despite unto the spirit of grace. The third thing this willful sin is, it is despising the spirit of grace. It's insulting the Holy Ghost. It's that rejection of the truth. Acts chapter 7, verse 51, Stephen preaching here, at the end of his, basically what was a historical account of Israel. And he came down and he told them what they had done. They had crucified the Lord Jesus Christ. And he summed it up here. He said, ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. So here we see the men of Israel rejecting the message. They rejected God the Father in the Old Testament. They rejected the Lord Jesus Christ when they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And they took Barabbas instead. And here, Stephen said how they resisted the Holy Ghost. And they took and they stoned Stephen to death. And they did despite unto the spirit of grace. Acts 28 Verses 25 through 27, the Bible says, When they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people and say, Hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. Notice this, For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are, are dull of hearing and their eyes have they closed. This is the rejection of the Spirit of God as the Spirit of God takes the Word of God and begins to convict of sin and, and righteousness and judgment to come. And these men, they, they closed their ears, shut their eyes, and rejected the Word of God. Acts 13, verse 46 Bible says, then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, it was necessary that the word of God should first have been given or have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. So here we see the word of God, when the word of God is preached and when there's this understanding when people receive the knowledge of the truth. When you hear the word of God <clears throat> and you hear that Jesus died on a cross and that he was buried and he rose again the third day and that death, that death that he died is the payment for sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through our Lord Jesus Christ. That word of God comes to people and they understand the truth they understand that Jesus is God. They understand that he died for sin. They understand that his blood atones for all sin and we can have forgiveness through him. And as the Holy Ghost takes, and he brings that word of God to the heart of man and they reject it. 
that when they do that, they put it from them. And God says he is going to turn to the Gentiles. So Paul and Barnabas, they turn to the Gentiles as there was that rejection. And that was the that's the transition that the book of Acts is dealing with. The book of Acts is not dealing with a transition of dispensational salvation. It's dealing with a transition from God dealing with Israel to now because Israel rejected their Messiah. <clears throat> they rejected the Son of God. They rejected the blood atonement. They rejected the Holy Ghost of God. And because they did that, now there's nothing but a fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation to anyone who turns and turns away from God and rejects the Word of God, rejects the Holy Spirit. Once, once someone rejects that conviction of the Holy Ghost of God, there's no hope for them. But a fearful looking for of judgment that's going to come. <clears throat> you know, the grace, that's the spirit of grace. That goes back to the Old Testament. <clears throat> Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And here, Exodus Exodus 33, verse 17, <clears throat> the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Moses, I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken, for thou hast found grace in my sight, and I know thee by name. Exodus 34, verse 6, And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. It is by the grace of God we're saved, and that spirit of grace comes, <clears throat> the conviction that comes by the Holy Ghost of God, and it is a conviction that if you're saved, you know exactly what I'm talking about, that conviction that comes, and you you sense and feel the condemnation of God. I remember as a 13-year-old kid feeling that condemnation of God, but it wasn't condemnation with no hope. It was a conviction of of guilt before a holy God. And yet in that conviction, there was grace and mercy that was available. And I remember when I went forward in that church service and I knelt and I asked Jesus Christ to save me and forgive me, he saved me in that moment. And I felt that guilt go away. And this peace of God came in, overwhelmed me. And the spirit of God came into my body that day. And I became a child of God. Now, there's people that say, well, you got to put your faith in the blood of Christ or you're not saved. Doctrinally, I didn't understand about the blood of Christ. All I understood was Jesus died for me and I knew I deserved to go to hell. And I did not know the doctrinal depths of that. And anyone that tells you that you have to put your faith in the blood of Christ, can you imagine going out and witnessing to some sinner on the street and telling that sinner, just say, you got to believe in the blood. You got to have faith in the blood. That guy's going to look at you like you're a nut. And I understand that there's the truth is, yes, that blood is what atones for our sin. But we understand if you preach the cross, Jesus Christ crucified, he died for our sin. Paul says the gospel is that Jesus died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again from the dead. That's the gospel. And you don't have to understand deep thought theological uh, things about the blood atonement. And it's wonderful. Once you get saved, God will reveal that to you. But if you reject that, then you'll go to hell. This I, I listened to a guy last night and it, it's, it's, I, I love messages about the blood, but there was people just talking about, if you don't trust the blood, you're not saved. If you don't trust the blood, no friend, if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll go to hell. And you can't separate the blood of Jesus. You, you say blood, well, whose blood is it? It's Jesus's blood, it's his death. And it's this hair splitting stuff that I see developing among some of the people on YouTube. It's to me, it's, it's annoying and frustrating because we understand that Christ died for sin. And if you want to teach doctrinal truths about the blood atonement, great. That's wonderful. That's the book of Hebrews gets into that. But don't tell me John 3.16 isn't for us today. 
For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. It's believing, trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ in his death, in his burial, in his resurrection. And I understand, yes, it is the blood. And this here, no doubt, these people here, they came to the knowledge of the truth. And there isn't a, you'd be hard pressed to find someone in America that doesn't know unless now with all the illegal immigrants, but you're going to be hard pressed to find someone who doesn't know that Jesus died for them on a cross, but it takes the spirit of God. And when a man rejects that spirit of God, then that's, that's the problem that looking for of judgment that's, that's coming on the adversaries the ones that reject that blood atonement. And it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And I'll tell you what, for someone that can tread underfoot the Son of God, you think when, when you tread something underfoot, the value of that is nothing. And you think when Jesus Christ returns, those that have rejected him here, those that reject the blood atonement, those that reject their Messiah, and those that despise the, the spirit of grace and resist the Holy Ghost, when Jesus Christ comes back, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 63, who is this that cometh from Edom? with dyed garments from Basra, this that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? Notice this, I have trodden the wine press alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment for the day of vengeance is in my heart and the year of my redeemed has come. There is the day of vengeance that's coming that the Bible there in Hebrews 10, 27, where it says about a fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. This is it. This is fiery indignation here where Jesus is going to trample the people that reject him. And does God love them? Yes, God loves everyone. But if you reject the Son of God and you count his blood to be an unholy thing and you resist the Holy Ghost, there is nothing to look forward to but judgment and you will fall into the hands of the living God. That's the warning we're given. And to think when God created this world, when he made everything, when he formed the foundations of this earth, the Bible says that there was a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And God gives us a little insight to think when he was forming this earth, that in his mind, and we, we can't understand the mind of God, but God gives us a little insight where we can just see a little bit and we can, we can perceive by what he says from the foundation of the world, that lamb that was slain when God was forming this earth and making the foundations of it in the mind of God, he had already come. He had already laid down his life. He had already shed his blood. He had already given himself the sacrifice for sin for all of us, so we could be saved. And you can you can question God why God did this and why God did that. Why did God make make Satan? Why did God do this? Why did God do that? Well, God gave. You well, know, God didn't make Satan. God made Lucifer, and He gave him a free will, and He decided to be against His Creator. And God made you, and you have a free will, and you can decide to be against your creator. But if you do, if you sin willfully after you hear the truth that Jesus died for your sin, he was buried and he rose again from the dead. 
there remains no more sacrifice for you, no more sacrifice for sins, because you rejected the only sacrifice that God ever gave for sin. I want you to think, if you're lost today, if you don't know for sure you're going to heaven, don't harden your heart. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. If you feel any conviction at all in your heart that you need the Lord Jesus, if you have any fear, and fear is a good thing, the Bible says that we save some by fear, others having compassion, making a difference. But there's some we can save by fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating the garment spotted by the flesh. You may have lived a life of sin and debauchery, but God is willing to save you if you'll just come to him, believe on him. He died for you, and he's coming again soon. Put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and his atoning death on the cross. Amen.